way we do it. <laughs> all right, we're on. Well, good morning, and thank you all for coming today. We're excited to have a few guests from the administrative building along with the campus buildings. Um, and this week, for me, has been an, a great opportunity to be in conversation with teachers and to take everyone from where they are in the learning process regarding project-based learning while integrating the many best practices that we know in order to leverage far greater student learning. So it's just been really fun. So to the teachers who've been a part, thank you so much. And I'm excited to see the products and the presentations. Enjoy. Well, um, welcome. We're so excited to go ahead and get started. And um, we just um, have lots to share with you guys about our project-based learning experience. We're so glad that you're here today and we want to welcome you. Our unit is titled, Build It, We Are Here. This unit is designed for second graders within our district in order to teach them and educate them about the overcrowding situation within our district and to ask them for help in uh, guiding a solution to help our district. This unit is designed for second graders and provides many cross-curricular standards, but there's a special emphasis on the community and research standards for second graders. Our unit begins with an engaging event brought to you by one of our administrators, and this will help bring the real-life event into our classroom. Groups will be formed, and everybody will have a chance to complete a KWL chart and planning guide in order to organize their efforts. Groups will then research together with teacher facilitation using a variety of sources. They'll have access to newspaper articles, superintendent reports, facility service reports, as well as other tools such as safe search engines, books, expert speakers, and more. After research, students will have a choice in how they build their learning space and how they design their optimal classroom. Each group will be provided with learning scales in order to help them check in and monitor progress with themselves, with their group mates, and with their teacher. Every group will have a choice on how they would like to present, and every presentation will be videoed and live streamed over our webpage. Classmates will then vote upon the winning design, <coughs> and the winners will get a chance to present in front of the school board so they can consider what the students have created. Our unit now begins with a special presentation by our assistant superintendent for curriculum instruction and special programs, Gina Gardner. She will be talking to you like she will be in our classrooms when we have this event in order to kick off our great project learning experience. Good morning, and I am so thrilled to be here today because your teachers are engaging you and involving you in a social studies lesson that is, has connections to mathematics, ELA, we're going to talk, be talking about all of that. But the important question today that we're going to focus on is exactly what your teachers wanted. What would your classroom design look like in order to promote an excellent or an optimal learning environment? You know, we started, I, I heard your teacher starting today's lesson with this song about let's work together. And let's work together really does connect to what we talk about with community. In community, we work together, we work collaboratively, and communities take on different faces. We live in a community, but also today, we're really here to focus on the school community. The other day, we read a book entitled The Mitten. And if this were real, I would really spend the time reading the entire book. But I'm going to just sort of capture a couple of things and ideas, so I'm going to approach it differently than I would if I were actually in the classroom. Dan Bad is the author of this. And remember, this was a classical story from the Ukraine, which is going to, we're going to talk about later in some of our global connections. With this book, remember that Baba, the grandmother, had knitted this most beautiful mitten 
for Nikki, the grandson. Nikki was so proud of his mittens. They both fit perfectly. They were the perfect design. Kept his hands warm and were the perfect fit for him at that time. He goes outside to play like we all do. Climbs up a tree and what happens? His mitten falls to the ground in the snow. Remember, it's the Ukraine and in the winter, what happens? <laughs> so when that mitten hits the ground, then Nikki doesn't realize it. He's engaged in his play. He just doesn't even notice that his wonderful mitten is on the ground. And he goes on, runs home, and doesn't realize that he's lost his mitten. As the day wears on, remember, there were some animals that came around. One of them was a mole. That mole had gotten really tired of digging all those tunnels, and he saw that mitten, and he was cold. So he thought, that's a great place for me to stay. Hobbles in, gets in that mitten, and warms up. What happens next? We would go, go through all that. And so, in the story, the mole, the hedgehog, the badger, the owl, I might be leaving out some, the fox, the bear all get inside this mitten. All right. And then this little meadow mouse pulls up. And watch what happens. This little meadow mouse tries to squeeze in, but just can't quite make it. And what does he do? Can you see that? Where does he land? On top of the bear's nose. So he creatively figured out how to get inside that mitten and get warm. Well, eventually they began to realize this is too tight for us. And they creatively figured out a way to come out of the mitten. The mitten flies away, and what happens? Nikki finds it. Nikki finds the mitten, fits in perfectly, and off he goes. But there's some connections here, and I want you to stand up. And I want you to get shoulder to shoulder with your partner. Everybody, just try to line up just across even the aisles. Just, just come on across for your shoulder to shoulder all the way across. <laughs> all right, and you're going to stay like this for a while because we're going to be talking about some things. How are you feeling right now? Warm. Warm. Yeah. Warm. Okay, all right. When you're in this kind of state, and the kind of learning that I know you love to do, because I've seen some of your work and the tools you want to use, the resources you want to use. Do you think if you were in that mitten, like those animals were, do you think you could utilize all your tools in your classroom? Do you think you could be doing those creative lessons, doing all that wonderful stuff? No. What would happen? You would be, it would really what? It would keep you from what? Learning. All right. If keep us from doing all that great learning we're wanting to do. Now, hang on. Hang on. Remember the other day when we were talking about, or your teachers were talking to you about the centennial? All right. In October, we're having in our community the centennial. And it, what, is that, what does centennial mean? Hundred years. Hundred. Hundred years. So for a hundred years, this community, has been engaged and committed to the learners of their community. They value education. They've always made certain that the right school was in place for their children at that time. And as the school has grown, they, what have we done? You've seen it. We what? Added, added on, built up. In order to have parking, we added, instead of just having one flat, because we don't have much land, what happened? Well Build up. All right. So it's very evident that our community cares so much about having the perfect, optimal environment for you to learn in. And they care very much that we're preparing you for the learn for the future. And so, your teachers are real, as you already you know that. And they have come up with this design of some work for you. And this work is going to focus on you as being a very innovative thinker. You're going to have a lot of choice. You're going to have a lot of resources, a lot of data. And one thing I forgot to tell you is in that data, 
If you next to our math lessons that we've been working on, do you remember those graphs we were looking at? And with those graphs, you sometimes see the line go up, and sometimes you see the line go down, right? Well, in our district, our data right now, in terms of our students, it's doing this. It's going this direction. Help me. Where is it going? Uh, it's going up. And so, if we continue going up, we might end up looking like this, right? Yeah. And then, can we do this optimal learning using all these wonderful tools we want to use, engaging in technology, and making sure that we're the innovative thinkers. And then the other part of this is, that, again, your wonderful teachers have designed this in such a way that you are going to be responsible for your learning. You're going to monitor your learning. They're going to have scales that are going to be involved, rubrics that are going to be involved, where you're going to be able to see exactly how you're progressing in your learning toward those learning targets. So here's, your, here's the challenge. Here's what I can't wait to tell you. They are ready to leave you with an idea and a question that's going to put you. Remember we talked about the community wanting all the voices involved? Well, who could be more authentic than children in the classroom, right? So you in your second grade classrooms, you're going to be able to help us by saying, all right, if we really want an optimized learning environment, we don't want to be like this, right? Are you beginning to feel kind of tight? Yeah, yeah. So we don't want this. We want an optimal learning environment where we can engage, where we can collaborate, where we can move around, where we can connect our technology. And so who's better to look at that and think about that issue or that opportunity we have than you? You're the ones we need. You are the one we need. And so each of you are going to be challenged in your teams to work together to come up with that design that you think it would require. You're going to have opportunities to cite with people. You're going to have opportunities to do research and engage with folks and look at data. Remember our standard about and our learning target around research. You're going to have a lot of time in that. And then I can't wait. Your community can't wait. Dr. Orr, I just saw him in, and he's been working with all these committees. And so he's been, and he can't wait. And so we look forward to coming up to see exactly what you designed. Thanks so much for letting me come and be in your class, and I'm going to be coming back in and checking in. See you later. Well, thank you so much, Gina, for coming in to share with us uh, our opening event for our PBL project. Our homepage states our driving question and it is written in child-friendly language. What would your classroom design look like in order to promote an excellent learning environment? We have also included a Highland Park community page on our website. Linked on this page are many of the news articles and publications written about this issue of increasing enrollment here at Highland Park ISD. These articles include student growth graphs, ideas of where a new school could be located, and even facility planning documents. Students, parents, and community members can click on the links to gain more background knowledge about this real-life concern. So once the students are introduced to the project and they're ready to get started, on our homepage we have two buttons. One is the KWL chart, and you guys are familiar with this. This is going to be their chart to kind of keep or to organize where they need to go with their research. They're going to look and see what they already know, what they need to know, and what they're learning along the way as they're doing their research. They have the ability, once they get to this website, to hover over the chart and then click on it, and it'll take them to their very own chart, which they can either save to their drive and fill it out using their computer, or they can print it out if they would rather fill it out paper pencil. Either way, they can turn it to the teacher so the teacher kind of monitors their learning and see where they are at that point. Once they've got that filled out and see where they need to go with their research, they're going to go to their graphic organizer or the button that says planning guide. And this organizer 
we've developed to help them keep track of everything that they're learning, all the research that they've done, things that they might want to include in their project. And then when they finish that and complete it, they can take that organizer and they can take the information that they've already put down and incorporate it into their final project um, when they're ready to uh, do their presentation. In order for the kids to fill out that planning guide, uh, we have a resource page for the kids to go to. The first thing is we have kid-friendly safe searches that we uh, they can go to to um, research furniture or materials, things that they want to include in their classroom. The last part of the uh, page are books, the reference books that they can uh, refer to that talk about architecture and how to build and how to build a classroom. The next page are all of our digital options that they may create their um, their classroom online. The first two, the educations and the pic collage, are apps on an iPad. The last few are websites that if you hover over the picture, you click on it and it takes you directly to the website. They can go on there and um, create their classroom. Um, if they are not um, interested in doing it digitally, there are other options. The other options, they may use graph paper, chart paper, and hands-on tools that they can bring from home or use in the classroom. On the how to build a uh, build page, students can access examples for ideas uh, on several of the entries if, if they need to. Then at the checking in page, we have housed a learning scale, an answering questions form, and a rubric. The expectations for the learning environment will be shared and thoroughly explained through a learning scale and rubric before groups begin their work. During the research, planning, and designing stages, students and groups will frequently check in with the teacher in order to assess where they are on the learning scale and where they would like to be or need to be in order to complete their project. At these check-ins, the teacher will provide opportunities for goal setting and scaffolding, such as a workshop that can direct teach. All throughout the experience, students and groups can communicate with the teacher through a Google form to ask questions, share concerns, or make comments to clarify, enhance, or further their work. The rubric will be used as a final assessment of the learning environment created by each of the groups. So, we want to share all of our wonderful work, and we designed a parent page so that our parents will have a clear idea of what project-based learning really is and what their children are doing during this time. Um, if you'll notice, we listed our primary teaks and then our secondary teaks. Um, the, it, there's a clear relevancy and purpose. They'll understand what's going on when they come to this page. They will understand student roles and teacher roles with this type of learning, and they will learn the expectation for their student while they are engaged. Um, so we hope by working together, as our song says, that we will have a very successful project. Thank you. Nice job, you guys. So the next group goes ahead and gets set up. We have time for voting and comments. So what you want to do is use the URL that's on the sheet. Um, you can either scan it or you can type in the URL that's right up here in your browser. And that will let you evaluate this team. And uh, the title of this project, you can put in Build It build it and that will let me know what this project is 
or whatever you whatever you put in, I'll figure it out as long as it's related to the title. So if you already did, it's okay. Can you when I submitted it and half the Uh oh, so yeah. we might have lost internet for a second. Yeah, I guess I'll Yeah, let me see if let me see if they're coming in. Yes. Whenever, whenever you've submitted it, you can hit submit. You can hit um, submit another response at the bottom, and it'll let you pull it back up for the next team. All right, I only have eight evaluations for Team 1, so um, make sure you submit that. Are you guys having trouble with the internet? You can't submit it. Okay. <laughs> wow, you made it look great. Yeah, I, I had no idea. Okay, good. Good. <laughs> and though my computer's not charging, do you think one of these got turned off? It's not charging. The broadcast is going to go So one of our power strips must be off. The one up there. And that's, yeah, we have quite a few here. Is everything else? I wondered why my battery kept getting lower and lower when I was plugged in. All right, team two, are you guys ready? Well, team two and three, are you ready? <laughs> team two and clicker, are you ready? All right. All right, are you guys ready for Rand? Okay, let's go. Uh, hi. Wow, that's loud. Uh, <laughs> my name is uh, Rand Nelson. I teach AP English 3 and 3 AP freshman uh, at the high school. And so for my PBL, um, I wanted to do something that would make summer reading more effective and make it more uh, engaging and just really relevant, you know, because the kids read it, frankly, we go over for maybe a week or two, and then we just kind of push it off to the side. And I wanted to make it a little bit more engaging, more interesting. Um, for AP3, the three books we read are Native Son by Richard Wright, The Awakening by uh, Kate Chopin, and um, The Grapes of Wrath by John Steinbeck. And if you're familiar with any of those three books, they all focus on a particular repressed people group. Uh, Native Son, racial minorities, particularly African Americans. Uh, the Awakening, women in general and uh, the parents of wrath and impoverished. And so throughout the AP3 curriculum, we really try to um, help the students gain not only a sense of empathy, uh, but a sense of just global awareness, which is really, of course, uh, one of our uh, tenets here at HP. And so we really try to, um, over the course of the year, not only teach them rhetorical theories, strategies, writing, reading, comprehension, all those important things that they have to have, um, but the college board is very interested in having um, an uh, incoming college freshmen, which my course uh, is a parallel to, having incoming college freshmen who are very aware of the world, not just their own particular socio-demographics, um, but um, just global um, identities. So my question, um, you can see here in the top, and also, I'm sorry, if you look at the italicized uh, shortened URL, you can type that in, and it'll take you to my website. So if you'd like to play around with it, feel free. Um, so I'm calling this Advocating for Change. And my driving question is, what is one um, repressed people group who suffers throughout history and in modern life? And how may we persuade the global audience, or excuse me, a global audience, 
through speech and visual art to effect positive change for this particular group and consequently the larger global community. So like we saw with a little bit in, uh, in the last presentation, uh, we want our students to understand that uh, even though we live in quote unquote the bubble, uh, people across the, uh, the city, the state, the country, even overseas, we all are in this together and that uh, what's happening to people over in Africa, over um, in the in South Side Dallas, is affecting us here as well. That we're all humans, and that we all have um, a role to play. So, um, first, if you um, want to click on a sign-in sheet here, this is my general sign-in sheet. I'm not going to belabor this um, through and through, uh, but I'll just point out a couple of key things um, for this Google Doc. The students don't have to particularly choose just those three people groups. They can uh, focus on really any kind of repressed or underrepresented group. Um, so if you scroll down just a tad here, there, there's a few lists, and this is obviously not um, comprehensive whatsoever, but they could focus on, uh, again, a specific religion. I'm not going to allow them to do their own. That would be a little uh, disingenuous. Um, physically disabled, uh, LGBT community prisoners, political or war refugees, and of course, as it says here, there are many particular people groups underneath those large categories. Um, and so this is, in my opinion, an interesting way for the students to understand not only historical implications, but how the world really functions right now. Um, I mean, you know, we're just reading about what's happening in uh, over in Africa. You know, there is a, uh, there's genocide still happening. There are people groups who are um, underrepresented in our own country. We have a large prisoner population here in America. That, that's, that, that's growing. And so these are people we need to be thinking about and um, understanding. Um, so if you scroll down, I have just a little bit more uh, of driving question and some of my rationale. And again, simply, this is not only for the students to gain what I like to call quantity of knowledge, quantitative knowledge, um, just, just facts. They need to understand what's going on in the world. Um, the AP test that they'll take in May is very interested to know what does the student know. But moreover, my class is also about quality of knowledge, quality of knowledge, uh, theories, critical thinking skills, um, reading and writing, these kinds of things that are kind of intangible pieces of knowledge that um, you can that you use quantity of knowledge and you put it together to make something new and sophisticated. Um, so if you go back to the um, website, please, Lauren. And everybody, thank you. Oh, Lauren is my great uh, helper today. Uh, <laughs> So I have um, some links here to the group contract. We don't really need to look at those, but I do have a rubric for the student that they can look at. And in fact, it's already um, the two tabs over one. If you want to show the rubric up at the top, the, very, the Google Chrome yeah. tabs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. And here is the rubric. What I, so for my entry event, um, what I would I plan on doing is having a uh, nonprofit group, um, a representative coming in and speaking to the class. Uh, my wife is really uh, interested in Voice of Hope, which I know a lot of our students work with. Um, bring a representative from there, or bring a representative from the Boys and Girls Club, or from uh, a homeless or homeless uh, advocacy organization. The event, the opening event, would have that representative come in, just speak on a few minutes about why it's important that we need to think about this people group. And once the student groups choose their particular group that they're going to research, they have to. Uh, communicate with a professional nonprofit or advocacy organization, and they have to invite them to watch their final product. And so um, this would be the rubric that I would send out to that representative. And um, in the assignment sheet, if you want to look at it, um, I have told students the way to get A or A plus level work is if that group chooses to publish the uh, student group's presentation. And so they'll have not only a speech trying to persuade a, an audience why we need to be thinking about this people group and how we can be helping them, but they'll also have a visual component. That could be a website. That could be um, a, a video that they create. That could be a piece of digital interactive art. Um, but of course, I'll also allow students to make something tangible. So it could be a mosaic, a triptych, um, a mural, um, a piece of actual physical interactive art. The, the, really, the options are pretty broad. For the students. Um, but of course, they could scan that physical object and put it online in a digital form if necessary. And so the uh, I, as a teacher, and the representative from the professional group will grade the students on these criterions that you can see here. 
And so the goal is for the students to not only gain research skills, um, critical reading, critical writing, um, uh, presentation skills, but also focusing on, again, the quantity of knowledge, just understanding about these people groups um, and using the theories that I'll be teaching them, uh, the resilient strategies, different types of rhetorical theories, um, organizational structures, and combining all of those into one final product. And so if you go to, back to the web page, please, this one. If you go to the project and scheduling, this is, gives a pretty um, general overview of the project for the students. I'm, I'm planning on taking about six weeks. Um, and you can see here, these are the different things that I would teach the students Monday through Wednesday. I'm direct teaching in workshops on different skills and ideas. So you can see all these different things that I would teach them in each of those weeks. And then each Thursday and Friday, they would have an opportunity to get in their groups, work together, and effect uh, an actual final product over six weeks. Um, obviously, this would move in, this would be both first and second six weeks. Um, so what I've also included, just in case you're curious, the week four for individual essay conferences, students always write an introductory essay for me, first week of school. Um, I'm planning on having conferences with every single student at least once to six weeks. Doing that while they continue to work, so even giving them another full week or, or about, and then they would do the group presentations, and this would be a major grade in the second six weeks. Um, and finally, if you scroll back up, there's a contact page similar to the previous groups. Uh, the students can contact me through this, or they can also contact me on my uh, teacher Facebook or teacher Twitter page. And so if they have any questions, they can always communicate with me, um, and hopefully I'll be able to help them. So that is my PBL. Um, I think this is hopefully going to be a really interesting and uh, engaging project for them to do over multiple weeks while getting them prepared for the AP test, which is one of my primary goals. So um, that's all I have for today. Thank you for being here. Thank you. All right, guys, don't forget to evaluate this project. Um, it's called Advocating for Change.
Okay, good morning. We are third and fourth grade teachers, and so this is a PBL design for the students. Um, we kind of are connecting it to science first and foremost, and the um, teaks that they will be introduced to in third grade and continue with fourth grade. Also, we'll build in the math, of course, and the components that go with that, and um, our language arts goes very well with this as well. Uh, our charge, our entry event, is that the Dallas Zoo needs our help. Our students have been selected by the Dallas Zoo to devise plans to help relieve overcrowded issues the zoo is facing. Students will work in teams to research the habitats and animals that can be housed in a satellite zoo in Highland Park. Um, before we go to um, our major field trip, we would be to the Dallas Zoo. Um, and part of our teeths in both grades are exploring the environment around them. So we will do a walk at Bradfield and incorporate our new learning garden, which we just installed in May. Our entry event, and then this, this website is obviously built for this presentation. We will also have a student website that will house this information for them to access and for them to access at home. So part of that is this flyer, and that's how they will be charged and uh, asked to start developing their plans. And then Dallas Zoo Field Trip. We will be on a field trip to explore the different habitats that are housed there, and they will also um, have the opportunity to ask the zookeepers um, about the habitats that are facing overcrowding at the zoo, and then kind of explore and start their process of thinking about what organisms, what habitats, animals could be housed in a satellite zoo in our area. Okay, following the field trip to the zoo, the students will return to class and they will begin the next phase, which is the nose and knees. knees. Um, they will use their background knowledge, their schema, to discuss with their peers uh, what they know about animals and their habitats, and then they will combine that with their experience at the zoo and walk around the school and the garden to use all of that information to gather what they know about animals and their habitats and their specific attributes and how they adapt to different environments. And they will gradually use that information to make their plans and begin discussing what they need to know. And they will begin organizing their information. And we have a rubric they will also use to uh, finalize their plans and discuss what they need to find out and create kind of a focus for their research to begin working on their projects. All right, the next part we're looking at is the scaffolding. And I say, I want to talk to you about what kind of documents that we're going to be having throughout the project and we have different benchmarks. And as they do that, we're going to make sure that they're on the right track. And this is a couple of things that we're going to be doing when they're doing the scaffolding. And the first thing is, if they're having any problems, they can use expert links. They're also going to be able to connect with some, this is the Fort Worth Zoo, so we're trying to get some local places that they can go to to see if um, there's different websites and webinars and they can talk to different zookeepers online, and uh, also the animal cam. Lots of zoos have different sites that they can actually see the habitat so they can look at, and they can view you know, what things are in the habitat that they're going to have to have for the satellite zoo. And then the teacher resources from the San Diego Zoo, and there's lots of different ways you can ask to talk to a zoologist there. And just different, lots of different things that and then if they're having problems after this is happening, then we have this Google 
site, which is going to be emailed directly to us if they have a problem. Then they just put their name, over it name, what they have a problem with, and then how lost they feel, and then they'll send that to us, and they'll come through the email so we can pull small groups together and meet with them and get their needs met individually. I'm going to talk a little bit about benchmarking. Um, benchmarks are a very important component of PEL, and um, this will help us make sure that our students are on the right track and to be able to assess them along the way. As Priscilla mentioned, we will have a rubric, and this will be presented to them at the beginning of the uh, PEL project and also will be used to grade them at the end. It shows all the components of that. And then next, we have the How Techy Are You survey. And this will also help us um, and our students decide in their groups what type of job they would like for their project and um, to see you know, what their strengths are and who is going to be doing what within that project. And then the Animal Info Chart and Checklist, as they are researching, this is a tool that they can use to document their research on the different habitats and different animals and what their needs are. And then uh, we came up with a vocabulary requirement. These are vocabulary words from the third and fourth grade teaks that will be important for them to learn and understand along the way. They can use any um, medium to present these different vocabulary words to show us that they've learned them and understand them. And then we have our zoo planning form. One of the components of their project is to actually have a blueprint of what their zoo is going to look like in Home Park. And this helps them plan that um, and record their research. I'm going to talk about the actual project itself. Our, uh, all of this research and all of the data gathering that our kids do will be put together in a project that presents do satellite zoo that they created to their classmates and hopefully to the Dallas Zoo. When, uh, it starts off with them deciding based on their strengths through their surveys and through their research and their knows and needs to know. They have to pick a job and they have a list of different jobs that they will be able to do through their group. Then there are different um, links for different tech tools to help them be successful at designing their zoo. And there are just different things that we have seen through our workshop with PPL that we found would be really helpful for our kids and engaging. There is a reference planner. So whenever they have to do their blueprint, they have to kind of know what kind of space each type of animal would need. So there's a, at the beginning of that, there's a reference to what kind of square footage each type of animal would need to kind of give them a guide. And then there's some sample blueprint drawings and done on different programs that they can choose from. And then, of course, some kids may choose to do a pencil paper blueprint, and then we could take pictures, scan it in, and then incorporate it into their project. For their about final evaluation, we also liked the fair grading project, where they had to peer evaluate and self-evaluate. In addition to the rubric that we had shown you earlier, they would have the option to weigh in on their grade as well. And in addition to the actual project, we added a handy links page to kind of guide where they will be researching. Sites that we had gone to explore, we know they're safe, we know that they have good content to help them be successful. So we think that this is a great project. We love the fact that third grade can do all animals. And then as we move into fourth grade, we really get to focus in on Texas animals. And it's a nice segue and bridge between the two grade levels creating a nice plan for science, building it in, and it's really engaging. We had a lot of fun building our website and 
look forward to making it a kid website on the new website. So we're very excited about that as well. Thanks, guys. Thank you. I just don't, I'm really not sure where you're going to put it. I'm, I'm thinking in the park. We're, we're going to really build a zoo nice. up. Yes. Up. Yes, the first multi story zoo. <laughs> the giraffes are on the first, on the very top floor. <laughs> yes, so they can have a lot of room for their necks. How many project groups are there? Eight. Oh, so are we eight instead of the six? Yeah, eight. Okay. Yeah. Who do we call them? Um, I don't know. Okay, don't worry about it. No, 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 I'm just going to It's just really slow right now. I'll probably get it on the stream. Don't worry about it. Not that slow. Okay. I'll put one of the ones in. Yeah, for everyone. Whatever you are. If you see a lot of heads down, probably. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So welcome to I Don't Want to Die, um, <laughs> final project or presentation for the PBL. I wanted to give you a little bit of insight to how this project uh, developed. A couple of years ago, I was able to work with Edna Vivian in one of the TLCs. And the projects there were really uh, to engage our students with the globally competent portion of learning learner for the future. And as I continued to work through that process, a couple of things became very clear. And the first thing was this really worked best at, around a cross-curriculum strategy. And then when I started thinking cross-curricularly, I realized that this was a it was going to be a big project. So I felt a little overwhelmed and I felt a little bit frustrated with my process and my movement forward through that stage. Um, and so what we decided, or what I decided was, if this is going to be a 600 student project, um, uh, what, how can we do it that's most student-centered, and also how can I get my team on board? So we, um, in that project, and during that process, we also worked with teachers from New Tech High School, and they said that PB, the PBL strategy was really successful for them in a lot of ways. And therefore, was successful for would be successful for us, and I thought that that was true. So, during that process, um, we've moved forward throughout last year. We were allowed some professional development time to work with the World Geo team in order to suss out some specific details to move forward. And then, obviously, now we're being supported once again with being able to have this PBL workshop to actually get the work done. Um, and most importantly, I have wonderful teammates who are willing to support me through this project. And now, as a group, I think we're really ready to move forward with the vision of working cross curricularly with all 600 freshman students next year. So, our um, DQ driving question is based on creating a public awareness campaign where students have to define for themselves a target audience based on a disease and go forward with trying to solve the problems associated with that disease. And I'll let Hunt kind of get you into the rest of the product. Thank you. Yeah, so for our entry event, we started a game where we're going to play a game that we lovingly call, lovingly call Secret Death. So to get the party started, <laughs> we will be dressed in hazmat suits. Uh, the students will come in, and they'll be given a picture of a disease, a communicable disease, some lethal, some not, and the name. Uh, job is, at that point, for the students to quickly, on the fly, research with their technology, um, the, the lethality of that disease, and then form into groups. The object of the game is for the non-lethal diseases to get together in a large group. Uh, without any lethal diseases. And the, the object of the game for the lethal diseases is to break into those little bitty groups, or those larger groups of the non-lethals. Then at that point, uh, we'll kind of you know, disseminate and, dis and, and discuss and talk about the, the way viruses work and, 
and, and germs work and, and how diseases are communicated to people and, and uh, we'll, we'll get a little discussion. And the thinking behind this was that we really get a chance to uh, do real world applications and discussions and where these discussions might lead about how virology works and how pathogens are communicated and communicable diseases and things like that. Uh, and so it was a really good opportunity for us to, to do that. And now I think what we'll do is we'll, we'll go ahead and uh, uh, after, the, after each entry event, um, uh, the individual subjects' classes will go ahead and then disseminate the actual project and what their actual classes are going to be required to do. Hello, everybody. My name is Beth Dye. I represent the freshman English team at the high school level. Uh, this learning experience is multidisciplinary from beginning to end. And every component we put into it, we really wanted to think about how we were going to hit the individual learning targets in biology, world geography, and English, and as well as all of the goals of the learner of the future. Um, so we really, really kept that in mind as we worked through our ideas. In biology classes, students will, of course, be reading, working on reading comprehension, interpretation, analysis of scientific writing and data. They will talk about, they will evaluate uh, the role of scientific research in on the global, in the global community. In world geography, they will focus on socio-historical and cultural context as it relates to the target audience that their campaign is directed towards, as well as many, many, many other issues of global and public health. In English, we'll focus on subject-specific vocabulary. We will look at the use of language in the campaign. We will look at reading comprehension of, again, those scientific texts. And then that will culminate in the final learning target for English, which is an op-ed piece, where they have to articulate a persuasive argument about some element of their campaign and the disease they chose for their target audience. So again, as we move through the process, we're going to have not only the final campaign, but benchmark checkpoints along the way in each individual class. Now the groups, the, the students will be organizing groups, and that will begin in the biology classroom. And that's where their collaborative workspace will be. And then they'll have time in both world geography and English to complement that in individual work and class discussion. And those the checkpoints we do, for example, in biology, in the research phase, they would check the cohesion and relevance of their research articles. Whereas in English, we would check the annotation notes on those articles. Everything's designed to work together. And we have created a lot of resources, and this Townsend is going to walk you through some of the resources that students will use along the way. Thank you. I'm Mary Townsend, and I am woman this puppet. She has coached into this thing. So anyway, I'm here, with, I'm here for the biology team. Um, one of the things we know, you know as we go along, freshmen, we're talking tag, pre, P, standard. We're talking the whole you know, caboodle of types of kids. And so we really wanted to make sure that there were some workshops available for them if they wanted to get some extra help. Um, the whole point of this campaign is that eventually it should be housed on a website. Now, the campaign may not be a website, but it has to be housed there because there are three different subject areas trying to grade one project. That is hard if you don't house it somewhere where you can all see it. So we've added tutorials for Weebly, Blogger, um, we've added some tutorials for the furniture, the things that they're going to use for their campaign. S'more, which I don't know if any of our kids have really ever used. Um, Powtoon, Animoto, some of those things. So they have some resources, depending on their target audience, of what they're going to use. Um, as far as the final product is concerned, it will be split into two parts. They're going to have the campaign itself, which will be created, or which will be created in our world geography section. And they're going to look at the entire campaign in its cultural context. And then you're going to have a presentation part, which will be done during final exam time. Um, hopefully, we'll get our final exams moved to after end of course. That will give us two weeks after to work on it. And then during our final exam hour, that's when all the presentations are going to make during their biology classes. And this really makes it a public awareness campaign because they're going to reach out to their peers and the community. We're going to invite adults from the community, whether it's parents or other members. So it really becomes public awareness. It's not just something that they threw together, but they're actually going out um, for an audience or a specific audience. 
Um, we have two eighth graders who gave up three days of their summer, um, so good for them. That are going to walk you through a presentation that they came up with. Let's and just say this: they came up with it yesterday and put it all together, which is amazing. So here they are. Um, I'm Rachel Rogers. My name is Ella Bowman, and we're in the morning freshman. And the homepage is where you have your basic information about your product. And this is like our mock product. It's just a rough sketch of like what it would be like next year. So one of the things we thought should definitely be on the homepage would be the answer to the driving question. So our answer was. Providing the central United States with knowledge about mosquitoes carrying West Nile virus. And also on this page, we, go and we, um, we have like a logo kind of thing, and it's just like the name, but because um, if this is an actual campaign, then you have like your organization name and stuff like that. And we were just given the disease by the teacher, by the teachers. So we had to find the target audience, and the way we did that was we were looking at maps of where the West Nile disease was showing up in the past few years. So that's how we came up with this in the United States. Um, the next tab is what is West Nile? And this is where you have your information that the target audience would want to read. This is something that's easier to read, and it doesn't sound like a doctor wrote it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and it, Further down this page, I made a s'more, which is like a, it's basically a flyer to because if your disease is only found in rural places where they don't have access to internet or phones, you have to have things that they could access to make it an actual campaign. So we made a flyer in case people in the central United States didn't have internet. Or um, if you're doing West Nile in Africa, you use a flyer instead of a website. So this is where you have like your English requirements. This would be where you have your comment. This is, and this is where you're trying to inform and persuade the target audience about a um, facet of your disease. An example that you can write about would be the plane dropping all the chemicals and things to kill the mosquitoes, but you're, some people are arguing about what else could they be killing. And also under this we have, we really allow you to be able to post a form, and this is where you can also have your target audience ask you questions and say different things about the topic. And you can start a discussion with your target audience of what they would think. And under locations, this is where we have our world geo sort of stuff. Really, um, also has the feature that you can make your slideshow by inserting images. This is where you have like charts and demographics about what your disease and who target it. We thought for here you would put where the disease is and where it could be going and where it has a history of the disease. And we made a Twitter account in order to reach more people. Um, because um, people in other countries might not have a computer, but they might have a phone that has internet access. And Twitter is a great way to spread your campaign to other places easily. And Powtoon is like a moving, uh, it's like a it's PowerPoint, but it has more features and moving parts to it. This is also a way to target a younger audience too, because they a younger audience would not want to sit through and read bullet points and <laughs> <laughs> so they could watch this and get all the information they need. And you can put photos and screenshot type information, obviously. That's the next way to tie it with the And um, this is giving be, doing, helping working on this project has made me really excited for ninth grade, and, and I really can't wait to do the project the last two weeks to solve this. So. And I think this is a very interesting idea to incorporate three different subjects because it's not something that we usually do in school. And the last two weeks of school, instead of having three different projects, we'll just have one, so it'll be sort of less stressful and easier to juggle. 
And a lot of times different classes don't work with each other, but in reality we should be working together in different subjects. And I think implementing PBL is something that I believe will really work with other students. Can we take a break for about five minutes? Okay. We're going to take a five minute break. Good job, you guys. Thank you. What do you think? Thank you. 
Let me get Edna, and then we'll be ready.
that the students can go to it for the third graders and actually see what the steps of the PBL will be through or the process that they can go through and the different things that they'll do. Um, and we'll go through what the purpose is and the entry event, how they need to know. And then workshops that we'll do will depend on um, direct teach with third graders. Um, on what specific things, how research actually works. Um, so we'll cover lots of different things, not just the scientific things. And then we'll go through um, the different benchmarks, the, versus the skills that they'll do, and rubrics, and their KWL, and with their final product. And we wanted to allow lots of choice in this, how they want to present their final product, um, also, how they record their notes um, as they're researching to figure out if it is, you know, fast or not. And the QR code at the bottom um, will take you to our plan. And this would be a good document that could be shared with parents or teachers on our team or another campus because it goes into more in-depth detail about the learning targets that we have and just the design philosophy based around our PBL unit that we plan. We hope you enjoyed it. And we want to thank Laura and Sarah for busting the net. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> really unfair advantage they had. <laughs> Uh, 
in, in a different place than South Africa and then begin to make those connections as they read the text. So I'm calling this, there are so, so, so many ways to break down a culture. So um, the overview of the project is a little bit, this is a little bit about the story for those of you that haven't read it. Um, it's about the Reverend Stephen Kamalo and he navigates um, the intricate uh, world of South Africa, specifically Johannesburg. He's in search of his family, um, and his family has been broken apart by these very complex social issues that many are facing. So while it's a fictional story, it's set in the middle of very real problems, and they're very real problems that um, people are still facing. And I want our students to see the connection between the fiction uh, that they have trouble connecting with and the greater problem of what's important within the text. So I have to, in order to understand this journey, um, they're going to have to complete one of their own. Uh, I've planned this to be about a week, um, about a week project. So it's not a huge amount of time because uh, the novel does take quite a bit of time to teach in the classroom. But I do want them to, to be able to uh, kind of sink their teeth in just a little bit to these issues. And then this would be something they would present before the, the introduction to the novel, but then that we would continue to revisit throughout the reading of the novel, and probably after they are finished with the novel, then go back to these issues and make those deeper connections. That's what we're really looking for. Um, so this is kind of an outline of um, what they would do. So they'll be um, assigned teams and a topic, um, and we'll go through the topics in just a minute. Um, and then they will uh, really, their, their project is really to get out there and research what is, they're going to be given this overarching question, and they're going to have to find out where is this, where is this happening? Where is it happening in the world? Um, where are some different places that it's found? Is it only in one place? Is it in multiple places? And you'll see that the topics are all very different. Um, so it'll be really up to them to kind of get into the nitty gritty of their topic. Um, what can they find out about it? Um, we'll create a KW Bell chart um, as a Google Doc that they'll be sh that will be shared with their team, and will also be shared with me. And they will create at the beginning of the project once they're assigned their topic. But what are their questions? What do they know about this? Maybe nothing. What do they need to know? And they'll continue to um, adapt that throughout the project. So they'll keep going back to that um, sort of that um, benchmarking process of. Okay, have I answered these questions? Are there new questions that have come up from, from my findings? Um, they'll need to formulate a plan. How are they going to share their information? They'll need some sort of technological medium. And since I work with really technological savvy students, um, as sophomores, they uh, generally have kind of some favorite mediums. So I'm not giving them one platform they have to use. Um, I, actually, I did a project last year where they used the platform of Attack, which some of them really liked, but some of them really resisted. They wanted to use a different form. So I'm going to give them the flexibility in this project um, that they can go out and um, use what tool they're comfortable with. So that would be a place where we would do some workshopping. Here are the tools that are available. Here are some ways um, that they could Present their present their findings. Um, I'll, I'll want them to formulate a plan. Okay, so here's once they figure out the problem. Here's the problem. What can we do about it? Um, who um, who's affected? How could we in some ways solve the problem? Um, they'll put their link wherever they're housing their um, findings on our Google forum, and this is something I've had a lot of success with in the past as well. Um, and that way it is um, available to the classes. Now what we're also going to do with this project is they're going to present the findings to their class, but then we're going to have them present their findings to the other English 2 3 courses. So there are two other teachers um, that are on the team with me, and so we'll you know, probably get the, hopefully the, maybe the auditorium or the, um, Multi-purpose room, there we go. Um, and have them have a larger audience, all students that are going to be reading Pride of the Beloved Country um, and working through these very complex issues. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the, um, 
the issues. So this is the, the topics. Uh, so this is just kind of an overview of each of their. So each topic has its own driving question, in a sense. And so there, one student, one group is going to look into um, apartheid uh, because one of the really important factors in understanding the novel is understanding how apartheid started and then how it subsequently ended, but its lingering effects throughout the country. Um, education. Specifically in the novel, we have an issue of an uneducated population and what is it like when the majority of the population is uneducated, where are the effects on the culture. So this is really about culture and about society, and we want the students to really look at these specific issues throughout the world. Um, poverty, so, to, to clip through these, this idea of uh, what do you do when the majority of the people in your culture live in poverty. Um, if, if you're not familiar with the world, or not familiar with, I'm sure you're probably familiar with South Africa, um, you know, they, there's a culture where a minority controls a vast majority. And um, we want students to really make connections, that this is not just a book that they have a hard time reading, that they don't know anything about South Africa, and the names are weird. You know, these are all things that I can hear. Do I have to memorize the names? Yes. Um, it's really about creating a connection that is deeper than just South Africa. And, and is you know, a human connection to, to issues throughout the world. Um, so the one, let's see if we'll go back to the grand um, So the, the topics, I have a, a quote for each topic and a quote for some. Um, so you know, environmental controls, um, this idea that Part of the population is unable to thrive because they don't have good land management strategies. And I'm here, so I'm going to go back to um, the principal of the time and do the, do the land expectation. So, as in um, Explain to the students why we're doing this, what are the connections to their own curriculum. Um, I have provided the teats for them. And that's something that I found to be really helpful with the students is to explain the bigger picture. What is it that we want you to gain from this? And here are the state standards and how and talk through them a little bit. They're obviously worded in a way that is sometimes a little bit off-putting to a sophomore student, but very easily and in a discussion, we'll go through and talk about, here's what I want you to get from this. Here's what's important. It's this idea about creating a global competency and encouraging um, a student who um, understands the values and ideals of a democratic society and understands and appreciates where they come. So the way that the students will be evaluated, um, they will have, as I said, the, they'll keep the the KWL chart, and we'll keep that throughout as the benchmarking process. And I also really liked the fair grading procedures, the evaluation procedure that um, Amy provided us last week's sessions. That the students will have a hand in their own assessment. Um, there'll be a rubric, which I didn't have, um, didn't have quite enough time to put together the whole rubric, uh, but they will have a rubric in place that will judge the project and the content uh, based on the, the standards and the learning expectations. Um, and we'll also be using the group contract. And I put this page on the site. Um, one thing that the students really like to do is talk to each other. So this is a place where they can use their resources. They can use each other, post, hey, here's a great website. Here's a great connection and um, hopefully connect with each other in that place. How did you manage that the timer went off the very last <laughs> syllable <laughs> that you said? She was keeping an eye on it. Yeah. I'm 
I know, me too. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. You gonna build a fire? Yeah, no. <laughs> yes. Which one was it for? Oh, no. Because I can't tell who's the source. I only see. Yeah. That app is unreachable again, and I click refresh. I'm not sure. Yeah. I don't know. Y'all just see. Yeah, I only see how many come in, but I can't tell anything okay. about who. I did just get one for okay. building oh, okay. that was just came in, so okay. I thought maybe that's what you were going to say. I was so nervous. Oh my gosh. Gina, I'm going to send you the link for this so if you ever need it. The links of the presentation. Talk amongst yourselves. <laughs> Do you guys need help? Hello. Awesome. All these gadgets. Yeah. Bonjour. 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 I'm Celeste Ranzaburin. I teach French 1, 2, to pre-AP, pre-pre-AP, and 4 AP at the high school. Applause <laughs> 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 Oh, yes. Spanish. <laughs> anyway, I'm Jennifer Whitaker, and I'm the intervention specialist at the high school. I'm actually new to the district as of January. So, um, when I signed up for this workshop, it was really, uh, number one, to have some formal training about PBLs. I um, had experience as a teacher and as an administrator, but also to um, get to know other teachers in a more casual environment as opposed to just you know, being thrown on campus and like, who's that new person that you know, really works? I work part-time. But anyhow, <laughs> actually, I work full-time. I get paid part-time, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> as all educators do. Anyhow. Um, so when um, we were going through the presentations and kind of getting the expectation the end of Monday, um, my main goal was really just to kind of be a resource and kind of pop in and listen and see what was going on. But God had decided that I would sit by Celeste for a reason. <laughs> and I have, a, well, I took French in high school and in college, and so I'm a wannabe French teacher. And so she's had to put up with my French all week. <laughs> but... Um, <laughs> Uh, I also have a great affinity for the learning of language, the process in the brain, but also just the acquisition of it, and how a language can teach so much about a culture and about a people and about experiences that they have based on word choices and things of that nature. So this has been a good a good union, and so um, and this is a really good point of departure because as Celeste will tell you that as of Wednesday around two o'clock, she was trying to leave. <laughs> Saying I'm done, and I was like, "See the thing? I'm it." Which is, please stop. Please stop. <laughs> anyway, anyway, and so um, her project is. What I love about her is that through the instructional coaching process that Edna did, um, Celeste came up with this idea to create a PBL for one particular group of students and use their their content, their knowledge, and their learning 
to really influence and to help um, with instruction for level one. And so it really is something that she holds dear because it's her program. What she does in level one will affect her students when they're level four. And um, it is really is a it, it's a great spiraling of curriculum. So I'll yes. hand it over. Jennifer, <laughs> Uh, Jennifer said it very well. Um, I did have one foot out the door, that was on Monday. But thanks to Edna and Amy and Jennifer, I decided to stick it out because this is a major paradigm shift for me and how I teach and what my classroom looks like. And they can attest to the fact that I was going, how can my students learn when I'm not in front of the room? You know? so, <laughs> I decided to let go and to try it, and I'm very glad that I did. So I'd like to start with a little video clip that um, is, it's uh, an old Saturday Night Live skit. You may have seen it. It's called The French Class. <laughs> Wait for it. Yeah, is it in the right spot? <laughs> I don't know. Yo, this. Look at this girl I did. Like eight. I can say. Yo, this. We. Where is. Do they wait there? Do they wait there? Oh, we we have to wait. It's too good to pass up. Okay. the time. Even better. Of course, this will happen to us, you know. Let's move on. So, Alex Baldwin does a wonderful impersonation of me. I, in, the beginning, in the beginning week of a French level one, where you can see the uncomfortableness of the incoming freshmen in their first year of learning the language. They don't know how to make the sounds of French. They don't want to speak French. And the teacher maintains that smile and that eye, that, that enthusiasm and all that energy, trying to get the students always to speak French. So um, <clears throat> this is my first EDL. And what I decided to do is use my existing resources. And my existing resource uh, that I'm talking about are my French for AP students. Um, I do have the blessing and the curse of teaching all levels, but knowing that my AP students were originally in this level one position three, four years ago, um, I thought that I could definitely use their knowledge of the language to uh, help create a product that would help my level one students uh, see the direction that they will need to go in ultimately. In addition, believe it or not, AP students, even though they haven't re reached that level of French, they tend to forget some of the basic rules of the language. And when they write their compositions, it is replete with errors and spelling mistakes. And they forget some of the basic structure of French. So my, my PPL is actually a two-part uh, process. One, it is going to be an excellent review for my French 4 AP students. Even 
they may not think they need it. Uh, and it will be a great uh, asset for not only my level one students, but ultimately this will reach all my levels of French because it will be uploaded to our class Moodle page. And my level two students, three students, can go there at any time during the year and get the same review. And so I think it will be very beneficial. I think that it's very meaningful and purposeful. Um, and um, I will give my French 4 students about a two-week window to work on this. We're going to start together as a group. We will discuss what are the basic structures of the language that you feel is important for the incoming uh, language learner to learn. What do you remember from your earlier uh, years of French as being something you need to review? And we will together create a list of those basic structure points. Once that has been established, we will, of course, move on to the grading rubric. And together, we will decide on the important points of what needs to be addressed uh, with, e with each group. My students will have the freedom and the flexibility to choose the group and the students with, which, with whom they wish to, learn, to work together. Um, they will have also the individual freedom to design their presentation in their image and likeness using their voice. So they will have artistic freedom and the personal uh, freedom to present in the manner that they feel will be the most effective when talking to uh, incoming ninth graders. And the target audience, the ninth graders in particular, will, I think, listen more attentively to the French 4 students than they will me, of course. Um, and I, so I think it's just, it just is going to be successful. I can just feel it. Okay. <laughs> um, it is student-centered, as I explained, because they will be deciding on who will do what within their groups, who will teach what, how it will be presented. Of course, I will be available as their mediator, as their mentor, if they need me, if they have questions. I will have to walk around and make sure that the content that they're teaching is accurate, however. I don't want them producing a product that is loaded with inaccuracies. So I will have to uh, walk around and check on that. Um, mastery oriented, I, I'm excited to think that the students, my French 4 students, will hopefully become the experts on these structure points now, master these structure points so that we can get on to the bigger task at hand, which is to, to, to uh, satisfy the AP requirements for this course and move on to bigger and more global issues, but they will be able to express themselves uh, uh, correctly in French, which is, of course, my goal. It will be fair because I also will use that fair grading rubric that was shown to us in our workshop. I, I think it's very well organized. I will use that. The students will peer evaluate, they will self-evaluate, and the group uh, will be evaluated. Um, and as huh? No, okay. And so um, I believe I have explained everything. And uh, this I see as a point of departure for me. I started small because I was unsure. And as I said to Edna, I don't have a vision yet. But now I do, and I'm already thinking of how I can tweak this. I'm already thinking of how I can do this with cultural topics, how I can do this with other grade levels, moving on to verb conjugations, verb tenses, all the exciting <laughs> parts of language learning. Uh, that you know, I kind of think of this as a flipped classroom type of idea as well. So I'm on board, and I'm ready to make it happen. And thank you to Jennifer. She was a great partner in crime. Um, just to sum up, you know, another aspect about this that I really um, enjoy or appreciate is the fact that um, every every teacher, every educator always says that time is the constraint. And so this is a way for her to kind of hit several points by the revision as well as the introduction. But the other learning that's kind of layered or embedded within is that when these students have to develop a product that's going to actually teach these concepts that were difficult to them to a lower level or those those um, 
early language acquisition is they are going to learn something about themselves and about their process for learning that's going to stick with them for life and really hopefully help them throughout the next uh, phase of their of their academic career. And we wanted to end on this video for Madagascar 3. If you have children, you know this movie well. But um, it really has a visual representation of kind of uh, breaking loose from the, the constraints of a traditional classroom. And um, it just happens to be in French as well. So. If I may add, um, in the voice of Edith Piaf, je ne regrette rien, I regret nothing of spending these past four days of my summer vacation. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> this is the song you're about to hear, I regret nothing. You're just going to have to <laughs> sing. <laughs> Stop the broadcast now. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> yeah, you made our day, so yeah. thanks. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> I'm still hoping to make it, but you know. <laughs> The name you've got right now does that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 
way far. <laughs> it's Breaking Bad has a the pop up series that was in the Yes. Learning how to make stuff work. Yeah. Yeah. And, and truly, one of the blessings out of these, this workshop is getting a leg up on the Google Drive stuff. Yeah. The apps, the slides, so that maybe we can have one of those mini workshops with the kids. Yes. Yeah. Huge benefit. Mm -hmm. All right, I'm Julie Gracie. Teach eighth grade social studies here at our wonderful Hallport Middle School. Sylvia Beard teaches seventh grade science. Wait. Lindsay um, Manow, sixth grade social studies. Helen Denko, sixth grade social studies. All right, I'll play a little clip for you. Our uh, title is a uh, stroll in parks. Feel free to sing along if you'd like. <laughs> Yes, I am a great singer. Thank you. <laughs> this is one guy that sang all the time. Strolling through the park one day, it was in the very month of May. I was taken by surprise by a pair of roguish eyes. In a moment my poor heart was stole away. A smile was all she gave to me. <laughs> of course we were as happy as can be. Immediately raised my hat. She responded with a shy remark, and I never shall forget that lovely afternoon when I met her at the fountain in the park. <laughs> Yes, it does. Like we said, we learned a lot about technology. <laughs> All right, so this kind of centers around. Eighth grade social studies, part of our study of the American colonies and exploration is to figure out why exactly people came here, what drew them to America or other places where they might have settled, and why didn't they all settle in one big clump? Why did they spread out along the eastern seaboard? And then we started thinking, you know what? Let's get the kids thinking about why exactly they came here. I know they were probably born here, but then, you know, why did their families move here? And how can we get people to come and enjoy our lovely community? So, we decided our interim event would be a letter from both mayors of the city of Highland Park and the, well, the town of Highland Park, the city of University Park, to the kids to design an intro video welcoming newcomers to our lovely community and what they might enjoy while they're here. So the letter reads, the mayors of both the town of Crown Park and the city of University Park request your help. We're soliciting advertisements to draw new residents to our communities. The format of the media presentation is up to you. Let your imagination rise to the occasion. It must be at least one minute, but no more than two minutes in length. Entries must be submitted by June 20th, of course, you know, to the Office of the Secretary of the Mayor, the top five submissions will be presented at a joint meeting of the Executive Councils on July 4th, 2014, immediately following the parade. The winner will be announced prior to the fireworks display that evening, and the entry will be shown as a keystone in an international campaign. Good luck. 
So their prior knowledge is why people came to the Americas. What drew them here, things like that. So now they have to go find out why people have chosen and how can we get people to entice people to come here to the parks. Responsibilities. Um, sixth grade, a big focus for us is helping this age children to work in a group because they're they're past the the elementary age where everybody seems to sort of get along with everybody and they're not really comfortable in their own skin yet and they're not really mature enough as high schoolers to work that efficiently. So one of our goals is to help them to experience it over and over again and get better at it. So because of that, uh, we all decided that it would be best to form them into groups rather than have them choose their own groups because we've all tried both and when they choose their own groups sometimes um, you end up with one or two groups that are a little dysfunctional. So we all choose the groups for that. And, uh, and uh, one of the other things about PBL that we feel strongly about is explaining to the children and also to the parent base that we're not just leaving the children high and dry, giving them a question, and then leaving them out on the line to sink or swim. Um, so we want to make it clear that once we give them the driving question, we're going to give them full explanation and many chances to ask questions in a big group. So before we even put them in their small groups, we would have the entry event we would read the letter, we would talk about the project, we would ask them for their questions, and we would answer every single question, every hand that was up. And then we would introduce the question slip, which I know you've all um, understood this week, but we happen to have it up here. So every day, each group would have one question sheet. And um, Amy has talked with us about how effective this has been for her. I haven't tried this yet, and maybe I'll try this yet. But we plan to try it, so every group will get one question sheet. And I think this will help them with problem solving. And I think problem solving is huge for sixth graders and for all of our kids. I think that's a life skill that we can help them with. So if one of them says, oh, how do you, you know, what, which, which mode are we supposed to work in, then someone else in the group might say, oh, well, Sherry, send that. See, it's up there. So we might avoid the superfluous questions, and then the group would get tighter because they would be helping each other. So the question slip is a technique that we plan to try this year. As Lynn mentioned, um, the students are learning how to collaborate. And so not only are they mastering the standards and obviously learning the things that are learning to learn, but they're learning to work with one another. So a way to accomplish that um, would be to hold them accountable, to allow them to discuss with their group the things that they would want. Um, to accomplish the duties and things like that, um, they would exchange information and basically establish a, a roles and duties. And so they would come up with this contract, each of them would sign it and participate in it, and if they were breaching the contract, then that would be addressed, and that's kind of where um, you, know, you as a teacher would come in and assist in that area. Oh, here's a safe one um, that could be used. And again, just an area for them to all sign, and then the things that they would, they're holding each other accountable for. We would, of course, give them the opportunity to use the applications and the presentation types that they want to. These are just some examples of some of the many lessons we might hold for them. Um, and this is just small, as we've all learned this week, there are all kinds of possibilities. And the kids bring in their own possibilities. I know my kids this past year introduced me to the world of Minecraft. I fell in love with it. We also have the students do an evaluation of their group members and themselves. And of course, um, like Amy said, we would hold those private. They would never see what their former group members said about them. Um, so we would want to know what part of the project, um, how much of the project they were responsible for, and of that, how much did they actually do? Um, did they do 100% of 20% if there were five members in the group, etc.? 
And then they'd have to explain why they gave their group member this grade. Um, you can't just say because, OK, well, you need to find out why they weren't there, because they might have a really good explanation. You might want to rethink that one. So it holds them accountable. Um, and then we, as teachers, could use those to base their final grade. This, this is a sample of a rubric that we developed fairly quickly. But this score rubric is on a 0 to 4.0 scale. And like any rubric, you can get partial credits. You get credit for the pieces you have completed. And if for some reason you did absolutely nothing, you earn yourself the appropriate score. But again, this is just a sample. And what we will now have so what we did was, uh, during lunch yesterday, we went around and made our own little example video of what the kids might do. And we're going to see if it's going to play. Can you just go where the video is downloaded on your computer and just get out of the PowerPoint? They're probably on the guest Wi-Fi. They're probably on the guest Wi Fi. That's probably the end block. We actually went as the students would do. We created that project of the students, which will be turned into the Secretary's Office of the Mayor. Live. Hi. Welcome to the wonderful city of University Park. Hi. Welcome to the wonderful city of University Park. 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 Welcome to the wonderful city of now this was our first snippet. I've never videoed with a Yes, we are. We are live. This is Helen and I am the videographer. Our friend Sylvia, a worthy group member, is off scouting the next location. Look how convenient. 
we like to get our exercise here in the park cities. So you can come and have a round of tennis and then go to the pool. Another reason why we should move here. One of our many park facilities, you can see the variety of apparatus to play on. And you know, even the ducks love living in the park cities community. We always want to feel safe in our community. And here is one of the fine University Park Police Officers. And in fact, this vehicle is meant specifically for traffic and parking enforcement. There is a booming business area in the Park Cities, as evidenced by some of our buildings here. Some more of our banking centers, along with many local proprietors such as Hattie's Cleaners. We're also a vibrant community because we have new construction. <laughs> Obviously, this will be a very large building. Perhaps the new residence that you will choose postal workers who will deliver mail to your door. Yes, I would. No way. <laughs> Just yeah. be a little plastic. Oh, yes. Somebody knows how to use it. Our baker. Oh, no! We have a message. Our bakers are loading cupcakes into the cupcake ATM now. You will be able to place your order in 30 minutes. I am so glad. Hi. Oh, hi. As we make our way through the Texas long grass, we find our two citizens of the parks. This is one of the biggest highlights of the park cities. What is it? This is the, the George W. Bush Library. When did it open? Oh, you would ask me that. <laughs> Last year, thank you. Thank you. Those are some nice <laughs> two ladies walked by, gave the answer, I'll take yours. campus of the Highland Park Independent School District. We're celebrating our 100th anniversary as a district, and the upcoming year will be the 20th year for our middle and intermediate school campus. The building? Oh, I see two of our faculty members. I wonder what they have afoot. foot. Lynn, should we go back to our workshop? Oh, absolutely. Yes, we want to be on time. Yeah, and, and I forget what's the name of the workshop. Oh, well, let's see, we have Amy there for Drive Technology and it's for PDL Lab Academy. Oh, yeah, we don't want to miss out. So we're going to go inside. We'll see you later. Bye-bye. <laughs>
what iMovie app, put the little clips all together, figured out how to upload and insert and all of that, and there you have it. With a little help from Amy and Emma. <laughs> Do you want to say anything on this before I stop it? 